Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. What Penny Hardaway means to Memphis, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, President and Executive Editor of The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Don Wade, Sports Reporter with The Daily Memphian, Jeff Calkins, Sports Columnist for The Daily Memphian, along with Dave Woloshin, Voice of the Tigers for some 30-something years now. So thank you all for being here. We don't do, I, I'm trying to think in nine years how many sports shows we've done. It's very few. Not enough. Not enough, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> not enough for any of you. Uh, we've done them periodically. Don's been on before. But I, I want to do a whole show talking about Penny, not so much, and we can get into, you know, the X's and O's and, and the sort of offense and defense are running, but more the, there, there is something happening in Memphis associated with, with uh, Penny's arrival as coach. And for each of you, what do you think, again, almost a little bit beyond the sports, what that means to the city, what it, what it means right now? I'll start with you, Jeff. Well, to me, there, there are certain institutions in this city that have meant something for a long period of time to a lot of people, and that's uh, whether it's uh, FedEx or whether it's the University of Memphis or whether it's St. Jude or whatever it is. Um, I think one of those institutions is Memphis basketball that um, has meant a lot, a, lot of, a lot to a lot of people for a long period of time. And for the longest time, it felt like it was almost going away. The last few years have been more abundant, and you wondered if this this institution that had bound people together for so long um, had become something that was really just going to be a memory. And so to me, what Penny means is, or the arrival of Penny means, it means the, the restoration or possible restoration of that institution that people love. And in the end, I think it means hope. Um, I think that's why probably what it boils down to is hope that Tiger basketball and everything that's wrapped up in that phrase will mean something again. And for Don Mike, for you, what do you think it means and why do you think there's this excitement that is a, it's about sports but to some degree transcends that? Well, it's interesting. After Penny was hired, I did a couple of radio shows other places in the country and they were trying to wrap their head around why Memphis was so excited about Penny Hardaway coming back, especially since you had national basketball writers predicting that he was going to fall flat, right, because other former players had gone back to their alma mater and fallen flat. And the way I tried to explain it to them is that it's simply more personal with Memphis basketball, that while the Grizzlies' great playoff run galvanized the city in a, in a really big way and you saw people come together, it still wasn't as personal because the Grizzlies, you know, haven't been here that long. And this is a generational thing. So that means when you do something like this, it echoes. Yeah. And, and Dave, Voice of the Tiger is back. Mm -hmm. We were talking before the show, 33 years, including television. For you, I mean, compare that you've been through, you've, you've again, I mean, 33 years of covering the Tigers and from real boom times to, to the bad times that Jeff talked about. Yeah. What do you feel right now? What do you hear right now? Well, a combination of both. I mean, there is definitely hope. And, you know, the end of the Tubby Smith era was hopeless because no one was coming. Even though the team was really not terrible, no one was coming, and that was depressing. And then galvanizing, let's just go back to the the real galvanizer of the city, and that was Larry Finch. After the assassination of Martin Luther King, it took Larry, who, by the way, was the second player to become a coach, it took Larry to get all sides together. And I think Penny is that kind of a, a guy as well, which is an unlikely story because people forget Penny uh, was not eligible to play his first year, and he was hurt. He was on a corner and there was some sort of illegal something going on and a stray bullet hit Penny in the in the foot. He couldn't play. And this was early 90s? This is early 90s and Penny had to sit out and, and, and Penny would have had to sit out academically anyway and, 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 and a great story is that Penny got his act together academically and became a good student and, um, and, and now you have this guy who doesn't need to do this, but feels the calling to do this, and is bringing people together. I mean, think about this, 18,000 at Memphis Madness. We had 2,000 at some conference games last year. I mean, that's, 
That's amazing. He brings people together. Memphis Madness being the, the midnight, I mean, again, for people who aren't necessarily sports fans, Memphis Madness, they even suspended for a couple of years. Am I right yeah. about that? Yeah. That yeah. is yeah. what Memphis it, Madness is, is the first essential practice, the first time you can practice and you can have a big celebration. It's really a glorified practice that people are invited to. And yeah, it used to be a big deal. And then people stopped coming. And so it went away. I was talking to the folks who run the Tiger Bookstore. They sell merchandise at um, FedEx Forum. And they said, so, so far there has been Memphis Madness, which is this glorified practice, two exhibition games and one real game. And they have already sold more merchandise this year in those few games than they sold all oh. last year altogether. Um, and, but there are a million different ways you could you can sort of tabulate the impact of Penny. Most of it's just emotional, honestly. It's just that there is a certain there's a certain um, giddiness about that I think is hard to miss. Yeah. But, there, but there's a financial component that's real. That Dr. Rudd, the university president, was very open about on the day Penny was introduced at the new practice facility, and that was basically that it was going to be more expensive to keep Tubby Smith than to pay him off to yeah. go away, especially when you have the chance to hire Penny Hardaway, which you could not let that pass by. And, and Penny coached, for those who don't know, actually, let's do a little bit of background. Again, for, and you'd started on some of it. Penny was, went to high school where? Treadwell. Treadwell. Mm -hmm. Memphis kid comes in, sits out a year for the, the reasons you just described, plays how many years at U of M? Two. Mm -hmm. Two. And then is drafted and goes to, who was his first team, Orlando? He goes to Orlando, but it actually was drafted by Golden State, and there was a swap with uh, Chris Weber. And he ends up in Orlando playing with Shaq, of all people, who he'd also gotten to know in a movie called Blue Chips prior to that. So they had a relationship, and they were really good right off the bat. And how long was his pro career, give or take? Well, the amazing thing is, is I think his pro career was 18 years. I mean, he played a long time in the NBA, but it was not what it was supposed to have been. When he came into the league, he was an incandescent player. He was destined to be a Hall of Famer, one of the great players of all time. He got injured, knee injuries, and so then he stayed, and he had a long career. But I maintain that had he had the career that he was on track to have, he probably would not be doing what he is today. And that is true, A, because he would be, he'd be Jordan-esque in, in, his, in his profile. He just wouldn't need it. But B, I think it left a lingering sense of unfinished business, that this is not the pro career that I was supposed to have, and I'm going to go prove myself in another way. I think it's part of what drives him now. So he had a long career, but it was not the career that it was supposed to have had. He famously had, had that, was it the Nike ad with the bobblehead, there was the mini penny thing, wasn't that? Little, was little that? penny. Little penny, that's yes, right. Yes, that was, that was done by a comedian, Chris Rock, and that became famous. I, uh, you, you make a good point about you know, wanting to fulfill something. Mm -hmm. But I, I've got the feeling, I mean, Penny doesn't need this anyway. No. Penny is still, I think his shoe is second or third biggest no. selling shoe by Nike. He still gets a whole lot of money from Nike. So this isn't about money. This is about, I, I've played enough golf and I still love this game. And there's this relationship with his former friend that was the high school coach at East that got ill and he sort of, fell into this thing and this was a dream that guy had for both of them and now he's fulfilling that dream too. I think that's a really interesting component, yeah. this love for this guy that has, and a love for a city that has brought these two tangents together. And he was coaching at East High School for how long? Yeah, so what happened was, yeah, is that he, he comes back to Memphis, which is interesting in and of itself. Like, he had played most, he played in Orlando for a long time. He likes to golf. He could have lived in Orlando. He played in Phoenix. He could have lived in Phoenix. Like, he had enough money, he could live anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that how many Memphis players move back to Memphis is sort of interesting in and of itself. He's back here. He's playing golf. He's hanging out. He's doing whatever. And he has this friend, Desmond Merriweather, who's coaching a middle school team and says, Penny, why don't you drop by and help me, help me with, teach him how to break a zone or something. And he stops by and he starts coaching that middle school team. There's a kid named Alex Lomax who's on that team, little kid. <laughs> and, um, and he ends up coaching that middle school team, and then he ends up coaching an AAU team, which is sort of an amateur um, team, starting his own, honestly, because those kids didn't have a place to play in the summer. So he started a summer team, league team for them. And then he ends up coaching at East High School. Um, and then after winning multiple championships at East High School with Alex Lomax as his, one of his, really his best, one of his best players, he then takes the Memphis job. So yeah. it's state, funny, and we're yeah, state, state championships, championships. yes, yeah, state championships. Yeah. It's funny because a lot of people talk about this iconic figure who, who, who sort of inherited this, went, 
he, he, he worked his way up in the most sort of grinding way possible. If he weren't, if he weren't Penny Hardaway, the icon, you would, you would think of him as someone who literally paid his dues from literally the lowest middle school basketball to get to where he is. And, and also, you know, you talk about the money he made and he could have made a lot of choices. A lot of professional athletes make a lot of money and spend all of it. I mean, the stories of, of, of you know, professional athletes Penny's who end up broke. And, he's, and, and that's right. <laughs> and, so, no, and, I, and I think that's, that, you know, everyone says, well, if I, was, if I was, had that kind of money, I wouldn't have blown it. But the stories are many of people who have blown that. And so it is that much more that he was putting in the time, I think, for people who are sports fans and kind of respect him, that he was coaching a middle school. He was doing AAU and so on. You know, maybe it's those kids from Treadwell. We ought to give, I believe, the... Uh, coach was Garmer Curry and I forget who the principal was but you take guys you had Hank McDowell played there and he's given a whole lot back to the community now you you take Elliot Perry Elliot Perry I mean he's doing he's so much still he's could and he by the way kept all of his money and now you you've got um, you know, a guy named Chris Garner I think he did well and, and a lot of guys from Treadwell did from that generation have done very well AAU, you mentioned AAU basketball. For people outside who don't listen, I, I know most everyone listens to your radio shows every day, but some people don't. Um, what is AAU? You want, Don, you want to take this? What is AAU? And, and it's a strange thing for people who it's, it's more than, you know, a lot of parents will have their kids in, in um, um, you know, competitive they, baseball, competitive, baseball soccer. competitive soccer. Yeah, it's a AAU little... basketball is, is that times 10, 100, something. Right. And in a lot of cases, the best players, you know, they don't have their whole family going with them like you like you see with competitive baseball or soccer which opens up opportunities if you want to call it that for people around those players who can see okay this guy's a definite major d1 player this guy's going to be in the nba probably a lottery pick someday so you get a lot of other things that are going on in aau and it can be difficult to navigate that as a coach as a parent even as a player, but you have to have those connections at some level if you are going to be competitive to get good players. And quite frankly, um, I think Tubby Smith, I don't know if he'd always been this way, but I think he had kind of reached a point where he really didn't want to deal with that. Tubby Smith, the former The uh, former coach. Tiger coach, where he really didn't want to deal with that very much because when he started in this business, you didn't have to deal with it at the same level you do now. Well, at, at some point in time, from my generation to theirs, um, I'm your the, same generation. <laughs> you're close. Why did you say that? <laughs> Why did, you we're all the same. We, you, we, didn't we're have pretty to admit much that. the same generation. Uh, Based on yeah. air color, we're all about the same yeah. The power of guiding young athletes went from high school coaches to AAU coaches. The more competitive players, the more competitive leagues, the quicker way to get a scholarship became your your path was to play AAU ball because you were getting a region instead of just your neighborhoods against each other. And so those coaches ended up from AAU with more influence. Tubby came from a generation in the past where you went to an educator, a high school coach, to find your talent. And that, I think, he perceived to be a little bit more above board. AAU is also it's less regulated. Right? Am I, am I right in saying that, or is, is there what is who is the governing there, body? Because there, no, it's, there's there are still regulations, and then the NCAA has regulations about what you can do with respect to the AAU. One of the to me, one of the interesting things about all of this is, is that the timing of Penny's hire is really interesting. He probably would have wanted the job when Josh. Pastner was 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 hired. Um, he certainly would have wanted the job when Tubby was hired, and Memphis didn't really take him seriously as a candidate at that point. Um, right now, we look back, and it almost feels like there's this sense of inevitability that Penny became the coach. But it's actually an incredibly unlikely story that he became the coach. And one of the things that that was good is because the university didn't hire him the last two times around he was able to have deeper roots with and deeper connections to the high school kids, um, including Alex Lomax, who I mentioned, including James Wiseman, who's the best player in the country right now. He plays at East High School. And so by the time Penny did, Tubby Smith flopped, and then by the time Penny inherits the job, he has, in addition to his iconic stature, in addition to more experience, he has these deep connections now to these players all of whom basically have wanted, had said, I'm going to come play with him. James Wiseman, the best player in the country, was everyone knew was headed to Kentucky to play for John Calipari um, and the Evil Empire. Um, and, um, and here Penny says, 
you know, it, most people, I think, at this point expect James Wiseman to come and play at the University of Memphis. We'll see. But um, it's, it's, that, it's those roots as an AAU coach that I think partly separate him from all the other NBA players who've tried to be college coaches. He is, yes, he's an iconic NBA figure, but he also has these deep, easy, deep roots in grassroots well, basketball. And then to your point, life is all about timing, right? So things have to happen. Tubby has to come in because Penny's not ready because Penny hasn't really won yet except maybe at the middle school level, but he's going to go on to win a couple of state tournaments to prove that he's got the medal to be a coach. Tubby has to, you know, sort of fail, and people have to sort of turn their back on Tubby, and all these things conspire, and uh, right. voila, here right. comes well, Penny at the right time. And the other thing is this is the way hiring gets done in the college and professional ranks all the time. You have one type of coach. Josh Pastner was, quote, unquote, a recruiter a poor X's and O's guy. When that doesn't go well, you flip and you go to the good X's and O's guy, the experienced guy, Tubby, but not much of a recruiter. He fails, you go back the other way. It, it's, it happens. Well, you hope you get the right combination. Right. Right. I mean, you're always hoping to get it all, but you rarely do. Well, the, the recruitment of Memphis basketball. I mean, there's a bunch of questions about this, so I'll ask a really dumb, simple one. Why does Memphis have so many great high school basketball players? I think. I think there's a couple reasons. I think. Or is um, that even true? Or is that just Memphis? No, pride? I think per capita, Memphis has very good basketball. Yeah, I, I per think capita. it's above the average for per, sure. Per capita. Yeah. I mean, partly it's because it's a city sport, fundamentally. I mean, there, it, rural Indiana plays it too and whatever, but it's fundamentally all you need is a ball and a rim and some cement, right? And so it's a city sport. It's a cheap sport. It's accessible. Right. Um, and so I think that's one reason. And then secondly, there's the tradition of it. I mean, um, uh, right now you have. Uh, players who grew up in Memphis idolizing other players, you know, the players who came before them. Um, and so I think a lot of it's the handing down of tradition and a lot of it's the opportunity. It's harder to play. It's harder to better get a baseball game going. You need um, all that space. You need yeah, you need all the space. You need organizations. Right. You need equipment. You need everything right. else. Um, whereas basketball, you all you need is a, a yeah, right. and is, is you need is a rim and a ball. Right. Yeah, it, it, you don't even take. need a rim because you go to a park. Right. You, all you right. need are sneakers and a ball. Right. 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 And right. as he goes, you, you go back to the 50s in this town, and there's always been a great basketball college team, starting with Will Fongs and all the way through to, to Larry and, and uh, you know, Penny and Elliott and all those guys. So there's always been, Keith Lee, a terrific standard with which people, kids, would lug up to and go, hey, I want to do that. Yeah. Uh, nine minutes left here. So that, I want to go back to some you talked about a little bit, Don, which is the, the business side of this and the, you know, you all mentioned attendance getting down to a couple thousand, reported to be maybe four or five thousand, but people would sort of count on their hands that it was about two thousand. The uh, first game was, I guess this is airing Friday, so the first game was a few days ago. Um, how many people were there and what does that mean, maybe the economics of, of that for the U of M? Well, first of all, go back to season tickets had dropped to like 4,100 in Tubby's last year, and now I believe it's tripled, if, if that's right. I think they've that's right. Yeah, they've already tripled it. Now, the way they're counting attendance has actually changed. Uh, they are, now, so for people out there going, yeah. how do you change the count of people? Yeah. Yeah, how can that possibly change? It's, it's kind of a shell game. Um, what they were doing previously, they were scanning the tickets actually used at FedEx form. So you were getting pretty close to a true count, but that's not the way most college programs do it. They include season ticket sales, whether those people show up or not. You have student tickets. They're also including anybody who's credentialed, whether it's us mm -hmm. or uh, staff and from the university. And this is all this method. Yeah, and it just started with the first game. So they announced just over 15,000. And no, there weren't 15,000 there, but it was a whole, you know, it was double what you were routinely getting last year. There were at least it, three times as many yeah, people as there. It, it was it was it was hugely different. You can't yeah, possibly I mean, it miss was, it. It's immensely different. It's it's um, and 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 the part of this, the economics of basketball in some ways are obscene. Tubby Smith was paid. Let's be clear, ten million dollars to go away. Ten yeah. million dollars his, his at a public walk, walk university. Yes, his even three million dollars a year basically, and then he had a little bit left over from the year in which he was fired. So they literally decided. You're going to have to get, get ten. We're going to give you ten. We're going to pay out your contract. It wasn't contract. a lump sum. They actually, what happened is, is the way his contract is, it's paid out. There were three years left. It's paid out over six years, so a million and a half a year for the next six years. Here's the amazing thing, though. Penny, this may not seem like generosity. Penny <laughs> took a salary of 1.5 million dollars a year, a three-year contract, which is a shorter than most contracts. 
certainly certain tubbies, which I think was five years, mm -hmm. and then and it was for almost exactly the amount. So in other words, they're still paying three million dollars a year, a million and a half to Tubby, and the million and a half that goes to Penny, and they're really not costing themselves that much more. Because of the increased sales and Well, and then, and th so then and so the so. other way that this plays out, and this is, it gets very complicated, is they're not the main tenants at, at FedEx Farm, the Grizzlies are. So what happens is, though, is that the, the Grizzlies get all the concession money, et cetera, and what they do is they pay the Tigers a lump sum depending on attendance. If attendance is a certain amount, they get up to $800,000 in extra money. They didn't get a penny of that last year because attendance was so low. Um, and so that's real scanned attendance. And so in addition to all the extra tickets you're selling, to the donations that you have to spend in order to buy the tickets, which is how college basketball works, and then you're getting this money for the Grizzlies, it's an easy financial windfall to do this. If, ahead, if we can just do the math very yeah, simply. Please, yeah. And he, he <laughs> nailed it, it's $3 million, so they're still paying that out but they didn't lose anything on that. And if I recall, and Don, you were at that press conference, I know I think you were there, Jeff, I, but I remember Don being there. Dr. Rudd, when we, he introduced Penny, he basically came clean and said, had I not made a change and gone through the, the contract with Tubby, with the way that the season tickets had diminished, the way the giving had diminished, and still having to pay him $3 million a year, it would have been a financial loss of $25 million. I believe that is what he said. $25 million. He really, in essence, had no choice. Well, and to bring us back kind of where this whole conversation started about the emotion of it and the passion of it, you know, you can survive having your fans angry for a while. The problem is anger inevitably turns into apathy. And apathy is extremely expensive. Apathy is expressed and donations you don't receive and seats that remain empty and that's what was going to kill them was the was where the apathy was who the, the dumb question number seven from eric who pays for tubby who pays for i mean are those boosters paying that or is that coming out of the tuition is that coming out of the the tickets and i mean where that, that comes from the athletic director of uh, the athletic funds which are a combination of tickets donations revenue that you get from your conference it's just all lumped in and then Tom Bowen has a budget with which he has to divvy it out. Yeah, but there's no question. If you're if you're going to fire a coach, for example, and hire another coach, you go to your boosters and mm -hmm. say, "Can you give enough money to make help make us make us do be able to do this?" Or if you want to give raises to assistant coaches, you might say, "Hey, we got to do this to keep the, like that's the same what, thing." For people again, you know, not familiar, a booster is not just a fan or a really, 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 really big fan. And what we really They're, tend to a booster is people who give money. But right. for that, big typically, dollars. boosters are yeah. I mean, they can, have influence. Yes. Yeah, there and there are there are there are people who have who give big money to the program. Exactly. Um, the the when we talked about salaries and again, I mean, so we talked about Penny taking what, what is a in that world a relatively small and short small amount for a short period of time. Somebody like John Calpari, you mentioned the Evil Empire, makes what? Does he make eight or ten million a year now? What's he? Uh, I think it's seven. But seven. It's, it's up and there. It, and it's almost an unlimited contract, or it's a five. Well, he was making contract. five when he was here. I mean, they yeah. had gone, as he said, to the yeah. to the boosters, who, in my opinion, are fans who are invested. Yeah. And and um, they 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 had enough. I mean, he he would have gotten the same money here that he got at at, at Kentucky originally. It was just a matter of him wanting to move on. But uh, yeah, it's. It's very expensive to be a top flight program. Yeah, you get, I mean, the, the best coaches get seven, eight, like what, but not you know, million dollars a year. Tubby was getting three million dollars a year. So for Penny to take a million and a half is quite a discount over what you would typically pay. With all that, and I said we wouldn't do too many X's and O's, we'll kind of end here with a couple months left. Uh, are they gonna, are they, how are they going to do? Are they going to win a Final well, Four? Or are they going to lead here's the, the nation? I mean, how are they actually going to do in wins and end, losses? In the end, um, we don't know how this is going to end. With Larry Finch, it ended badly in the end, right? But it wasn't a bad trip. Like, most end badly. That's what happens with most coaches. They get fired. Um, to, what happens this year, to me, is much less important than who they recruit. Like, if they have a pretty good year, which is what they should have, they're not going to win the NCAA tournament. They're probably, they probably won't make the NCAA tournament. But if they have a competitive year and they get the number one player in the country from, and they have... A, a top five recruiting class that will create hope and momentum for future years. And the hope is, is that ultimately, whether it's a year or two or three years from now, they'll get back to final fours and they'll get back to the same sort of runs that you saw under Gene Bartow, under Larry Finch, or under John Calipari. Any coach gets a honeymoon period. Your honeymoon period is longer when you're the favorite son, and that's, that's who Penny Hardaway is. And expectations mean everything. Once upon a time, it was exciting to go to the NCAA tournament. Then they got tired of short trips under Josh 
Passner that wasn't good enough. Now people would be thrilled if they could win the conference tournament, which will be at FedEx Forum at the end of the regular season, get that automatic bid, get to the NCAA tournament, don't even have to win a game, just get their people to be thrilled. Your sense of... Well, I, I, I'm going to go philosophical here. I'll say that life is not a uh, destination, it's a journey. And you go back to Larry Finch, that was a great journey. The destination at the end wasn't as nice as we all would have hoped. We don't know what, what Penny's destination is going to be, but this journey has begun beautifully already. There is already hope. And as Don says, the, 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 the tournament is here. I, I don't know that you're going to make an NCAA tournament with this group, but I think they can make some postseason, and, 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 and people are hungry for that. But the place is packed again, and the good feeling this guy brings. I saw him at the Lady Tiger game the other night. I mean, he wants to give back, and people just feel good about him and the school because of him. Talk, talk about is it D, DJ Jeffrey? DJ Jeffries D is one of Talk them. about yeah. that with 30 seconds. Well, here. DJ Jeffries is a player who just committed. He was going to, he, he had actually committed to Kentucky and he decommitted from Kentucky, meaning he told Kentucky I was going to go. That's what made, and he, then he later changed his mind and said, I'm, as soon as Penny was hired, basically he said, I'm not going to Kentucky. And then he recently said he's going to Memphis. He just scored 51 points in a playoff game. Um, so he's one of the he players plays, where, where again, at Olive Branch. Olive Branch. Yeah, he's one of the players who's in Mississippi and, and he's coming to Memphis. And so he's part of the hope for the future that, that, this pro that this program has. And you're being nice because in your column you actually talked about it being the double win, that he not only committed but that he left Kentucky. Oh, no, no. People <laughs> love, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it may be petty, yeah. but there's no question. People, That's because Jeff hates yeah. John. It it might be petty, petty, but we'll do a whole also, show It's also that. fun. It might be it's, petty, no, but it's fun. fun. It's okay. fun. It's all fun. Right. It's we are fun. out of time. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.